24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you should have an accident, just call us and relax. You can count on us to handle your claim quickly and efficiently. You see, here at Colonial Penn, we play the game a little differently because we think a safe driver deserves to win. So why not give us a call right now and find out about our program? You may qualify for savings. Call 1-800-468-1717. There's no obligation, and we'll send you this free flashlight just for making the call. So call now, 1-800-468-1717. If you're a safe driver, let Colonial Pen make you a winner. 1-800-468-1717. That's our broadcast for this Friday. Coming up next week, we'll continue our report from Moscow with a conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock. Also, we'll talk to the influential editor of the weekly Soviet magazine, Aganyak. We'll also talk with Paloma Picasso. The daughter of Pablo Picasso has made her own name as a designer of jewelry accessories and now China and shoes. And if you've ever wondered how those amazing magic tricks you've seen actually work, we'll find out from the amazing Randy. Until then, for all of us here at Night Watch, I'm Charlie Rose in Washington. This is CBS. Anna Hugh, weekdays at 8 on Channel 4. Today, the family of kidnapped victim Jacob Wetterling received this picture, Jacob's sixth grade class portrait, taken just a few months ago. It comes just one day before the official search for the 11-year-old ends. WCCO Television presents Don Shelby, Colleen Needles, Mike Fairborn, and Mark Rosen. This is the 10 p.m. report. Good evening. Tomorrow will be the last day authorities will conduct a ground search for Jacob Wetterling. In the past 10 days, hundreds of people have searched more than 300 square miles of rural Minnesota near St. Joseph. Today, the National Guard helicopters left St. Joseph after making one final pass. Tomorrow, a handful of DNR agents will walk the nearby fields for the last time. The investigation is far from over, however, and as Daryl Savage reports tonight, the efforts to find Jacob are taken to new heights. 90,000 flyers with Jacob's picture on them will soon be on their way to social service agencies, police stations, and hospitals nationwide. Organizers hoped a few hundred people would volunteer to help with the mailing. Close to 1,000 showed up. This woman came from North St. Paul. And I just wanted to help. It was one way to help because I have a family, two, three boys, and one that's 11, so I just had that kind of, you know, closeness with 11-year-olds. The mail is piling up in the Wetterling's home, hundreds of letters from well-wishers praying for Jacob's return. Patty spent her 40th birthday hoping the national attention to her son's kidnapping will pay off. I feel the pressure is on for this man to let Jacob go. There, there's nowhere, you can't eat, you can't buy gas, you can't go anywhere on the roads without having people know. This afternoon, St. Cloud Apollo Junior High School students released a thousand balloons with Jacob's name on them. And tonight, Jerry Wetterling visited many of his close friends in Albany for the first time since his son was kidnapped. And for us, we have hope. We really, truly, deep down believe Jacob's alive. A growing number of people are hoping their tears of frustration will soon turn to tears of joy. This time tomorrow, the ground search will be over. But with 400,000 hunters ready to kick off deer season, investigators hope those hunters find some sort of evidence that will lead them closer to Jacob. Daryl Savage, WCCO Television News, St. Joseph. This Saturday, 5,000 people are expected to join hands from St. Cloud to St. Joseph to show Jacob's family they still have faith. President Bush tonight has all but conceded defeat for the year on getting Congress to cut the capital gains taxes, his top legislative priority. The Bush administration was trying to attach an amendment calling for the cuts to crucial debt legislation. Congress must pass that bill next week to avoid the U.S. Treasury from going into debt. Democrats fought and have apparently won the capital gains amendment. Senate Minority Leader Robert Dole pulled the amendment off the floor. Northern States Power wants to raise its rates 10.2% and today asked the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission to approve that increase. It would go into effect in a year and it would come out to an extra $3.33 or so very close to that as an average on a residential bill. 
Residents of the Uptown area may be seeing an eight-screen movie theater in their neighborhood in the next few years. Today, Mayor Don Fraser approved the plan, allowing developers to move toward the first phase of that project. The nearly 2,000-seat theater complex would be a block northeast of the lake and Hennepin intersection. Mayor Fraser did not sign the council's action on the project, saying he's not completely happy with it, but he did say the developers have followed all the proper city procedures. Minneapolis officials say it's time to take action against the growing number of hate crimes in the city, and today announced a media blitz. The city is putting up 20 billboards, along with posters and bus stops in other places. There are also public service announcements, all fighting a recent jump in crimes apparently brought on by racism. We have to talk about it openly. Uh, the only way to address these problems is to deal with them openly and to uh, make it clear that this is not what the city wants, it's not what the elected leadership wants. We want a community where there's tolerance and respect and dignity uh, as the order of the day. Fraser says the month-long campaign will cost the city ten to fifteen thousand dollars. State Auditor Arnie Carlson announced his candidacy for governor today, saying education will be one of his top priorities. Carlson says he's concerned his fellow Republicans have lost touch with Minnesota citizens. Carlson dropped out of the 1986 race for governor, but says he is in this one to stay. University of Minnesota administrator today testified Luther Darville was worried about what investigators would find in his personal bank account after the audit that led to his firing. Jean Lupton said she confronted Darville with the results of the audit, and he said no one else was involved. One of Darville's former bosses, Frank Wilderson, finished his testimony today. He said he never authorized Darville to take school money, receive money, or distribute it to anyone. Darville has said that he gave away school money, but only under the direction of his supervisors. Colleen. More East Germans are making their way out of the country to begin lives in a democracy. Today, more than 1,300 young people jammed into the West German Embassy in Prague, hoping to be allowed into the West. New Communist leader Egon Krenz said East Germany needs closer ties with the West and said he'll soon announce a new law allowing freedom to travel there. East German diplomats have been processing about 100 people a day who want to leave the country. The California legislature today convened a special session to try to figure out ways to raise money for earthquake relief. One of the proposals lawmakers are considering is an increase in the state sales tax in time for the holiday shopping season. And the California governor wants to raise $800 million for relief. There was another aftershock last night centered just north of the original quake's epicenter. Officials say there was very minor damage in San Francisco. Visions, though, of a California-type earthquake passed through the minds of some Twin Cityans today. They say the earth shook, along with some buildings in the southern metro region. Bill Hudson reports on what happened. Yeah. They all thought that they were nuts. Workers were on lunch hour when legs rocked and tables rolled. I don't know anything about earthquakes or anything, but it was... It, it, if mm -hmm. I was ever in an earthquake, this would have to be something like it. That same sensation was felt in southern Bloomington, across the Minnesota River into Burnsville. Those who felt it say it lasted but a few seconds, but it left Brad Beckman rocking in his chair. And all of a sudden, the building felt like it was starting to rumble. And um, it was more of a, a motion like this. No seismographs recorded any earth movements. No sonic booms were verified. And also, I'd look up at the ceiling, I could see it all shaking. I thought it was somebody running across. And it wasn't. It just really shook. And I'm like, looking at the ceiling, like, is it going to fall? <laughs> Upon further checking by state geologists, the fault was found. A nearby quarry was blasting through rock with a little more powder than normal. With Paula Engelking, Bill Hudson, WCCO Television News, The Twin Cities. For the record, the last real earthquake felt in Minnesota was two years ago, and it was not really here. It was centered in Illinois. We just felt it here. I remember that yep. one. Well, looking ahead tonight, we're going to follow up on the young Bolivian man we first met last month. He had been shot in the head and came to St. Paul Pacho United Pacho. Hospital for help. Today, Pacho Penaloza underwent five hours of surgery. And then in sports, Winstead Holy Trinity may be a small school, but its football team is a historical powerhouse. But next in dimension, it seemed to be just an innocent crib toy. But this father says it killed his son. Next, how safe are children's toys?
Tonight in Dimension, the issue is toy safety. It is estimated that more than 75% of all new toys are purchased between now and the holidays. But just how safe are those toys we buy for our children? Well, consumer groups say 500,000 children are injured each year by unsafe toys. Last year, 37 children died. Some say those deaths might be, uh, have been avoided if standards by the federal government and toy manufacturers were stricter. And consumer specialist Sylvia Gambardella has been looking into the toy safety debate. She joins us now with more. Sylvia. Don, if you think the federal government tests all toys sold in the marketplace, think again. At best, the testing is lax. At worst, it is non-existent. No one knows that better than the parent who has lost a child to a toy labeled as safe. And I just remember jumping up and running in the room and finding him tangled on this um, crib toy. It was three years ago that one-year-old Bronson Cop of Rush City, Minnesota, strangled on this Fisher Price Activity Center. He was wearing a bib because he was drooling so bad from cold and stuff. And apparently his bib got hooked behind this knob and it couldn't come out. And I, it, it appeared he struggled, you know, to get away. You could see the bib was stretched, the plastic on the toy was stretched. So it was obvious there was a struggle for him to get away, and he just couldn't, you know. And well, when I, by the time I walked in, I guess I knew it was too late. It was... An autopsy report showed the infant died of asphyxiation. His father is now suing Fisher Price. The toy maker said it is the only death it knows of connected to the crib toy. Last year, the company redesigned the toy, securing the hook which caused Bronson's death. The federal government knew crib toys were dangerous even before the baby's death. Two years earlier, it put out this advisory on another Fisher Price crib toy. 30 children have strangled and died in their crib, yet nothing addresses, no government law right now addresses crib toy safety. The lack of government laws on toy safety was at the heart of this conference in the nation's capital last September. It was the first time lawyers, doctors, toy makers, consumer groups, and the government got together on the issue. The problem, consumer advocates say, is not so much with the toy manufacturers as it is with the federal agency, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is supposed to regulate the toy industry. Under the Reagan administration, the commission had its staff cut in half. Its budget slashed by eight million, and its five-member panel reduced to two. Three members are needed for a quorum to recall toys. Anything that would go through and penetrate, come out the other side here, is, is a violation. Bob Hundemer is a toy tester for the commission. You know, I think uh, people assume that the government wouldn't allow things to be sold if they weren't safe. That's not the truth. I mean, the government can't, it can't discover everything that is unsafe. Government testers admit federal standards need to be tougher. Witness the flammability testing for stuffed toys. Okay, I'm placing the candle on the edge for five seconds. Five seconds is up and there's no ignition. What other tests would this bear have to go through to meet flammability standards? This is it. That's the only test it has to go through for five seconds. That's the only test that we do for flammability. And you think this test is inadequate? I'm, I'm not going to comment anymore on that. You know, it's just a subjective test. Consumer advocates also say the test which the government uses for small toy parts, which can choke a child, is inadequate. Parts which fit over the rim of this test cylinder are considered safe for children three years and under. The studies have shown that particularly things that men are rounded, small balls, have choked children. And those balls, in fact, pass this test. A ball which passed the cylinder test was given out by General Mills two years ago in boxes of Cheerios. A one-year-old child in Texas died after choking on the toy. After that, General Mills redesigned a larger cylinder, but the federal government continues to use the smaller one. In the middle of the toy safety debate are the manufacturers. They feel they are already strictly regulated by the government. The common fiction is that the country is flooded with a lot of unsafe toys. The reality is toys are probably among the safest products made in this country. 
Toys may be safer than many other products, but that does not lessen the pain for at least one parent. Maybe they're trying to design them as safe as they can, but obviously they're not. And yeah, I get outraged at them. Okay, I'm sure they didn't design it to kill my son, but they didn't design it so it wouldn't either. Now, many toy manufacturers have very strict standards for testing their toys, and there are many more safe toys sold than unsafe ones. And tomorrow at 5, we'll show you how to look for all those safe toys. Don and Colleen? Well, as Colleen said, a lot of people are going to be buying toys between now and uh, the end of the holiday season. Any quick pieces of, of advice for parents on picking safe toys? Uh, the obvious things. Don't go for anything with sharp edges. Don't go for anything with cords or strings. And the most important thing is look at the age labeling. That really reflects more of the, not the intellectualness of the child, but it's f his physical makeup. The problem is if you have a family that has uh, different ages That's of children, then you've got to buy for probably the youngest age to be safe. Absolutely. And that's a hard thing to do. And keep an eye on that toy after you bring it home for parts that break off. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Sylvia. The Minnesota Commerce Department will be holding hearings next Monday at Bandana Square on toy safety. If you are interested in participating or getting one of the department's free toy buying guides, you can call the agency at 296-2488. That's 296-2488. Here they are, the pictures we knew we'd have to show you sooner or later. We were just hoping it wouldn't be this soon. Twin Cityans woke up to winter-like conditions today and were not completely prepared. There were dozens of fender benders around the area, but no serious injuries, thankfully. Well, I pulled out on the <laughs> Highway 7 and I said, look how slow these people are going. Yeah. I mean, no, they're not used to this snow or what. And then you got out there and you found out why they were doing it. Because it a, was... Less than a half inch. Yes, but most of that turned into ice at about 8.30. Yeah. You explained that earlier, yeah. how everything turned to ice. Conditions were just absolutely perfect to make it a skating rink out there. <laughs> Tomorrow night, we'll let them practice on the way home instead of on the way to work. No How does kidding. that sound? Yeah. Really? Looks like we'll get maybe one to two inches of snow beginning as early as uh, noon tomorrow and continuing on throughout the evening hour. So brace yourselves out there. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn Johnson caught this. It's really a, kind of a crisp, cool, pleasant night out there. 22 degrees is our current reading. It's the low for the day. And we were right at freezing for a high temperature. Two tenths of an inch of snow, the slipperiest, littlest amount of snow we could get and really made things miserable this morning. Clear skies right now, our temperature is holding at 22. West winds at 10, a dew point of eight degrees above zero, and the barometer is holding steady. Other temperatures around the state really dropping off. We'll see temperatures in the teens, single digits up to the north, maybe even some below zero readings by morning. That's International Falls at seven, Hibbing at eight right now. Our temperature still holding in the 20s, but teens are all around us, and our temperatures will fall into the teens tonight, making it the coldest night so far this season. Here's the clouds. Here's the clouds that came through us, first of all, early this morning, depositing the uh, light amount of snow. Moving on to the east, here's another clipper coming in from the northwest. It's already spreading clouds into the western part of the state. The clouds will be into us probably around daybreak, and uh, snows will begin about morning in the western part of the state, about noon here for us, and then continue on through the afternoon into the evening hours. One to two inches of snow accumulation is possible with this little clipper coming through. Here's the first one. High pressure temporarily over us tonight, and that's creating a big bubble of cold air. And as this warm front comes in, the warm, moist air will ride over the top of that dome of cold air, give us what we call overrunning, and that's what will produce the one to two inches of snow for us. High temperatures are going to slowly moderate into the weekend. The real cold pool of air moving on to the east. Temperatures back up into the 40s by Saturday and Sunday roller coaster weather. Mostly clear and cold tonight. 15, light and variable winds. Tomorrow we'll be looking at mostly cloudy. Snow developing by afternoon, a high of around 30. Southeast winds at 10 to 20 miles an hour. Tomorrow night the snow will taper off. We'll end up with one to two inches accumulating. Low temperature of around 25. And then for Saturday, partly cloudy, it'll be warmer with a high temperature of 42 degrees. The extended outlook, a chance of some rain and snow mixed on Sunday. Monday and Tuesday, clearing up and uh, temperatures in the 40s, overnight lows in the 20s. But did you hear what happened up in Hurley today? They get the lake effect snow up there off Lake I Superior. Still talent. snowing. They have about 38 inches of snow on the ground now. Is that incredible? <laughs> Going for four feet. <laughs> Probably inches. before it's over. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it up there. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. State titles are being handed out at the Dome tonight. Both boys and girls high school soccer state champs are being named. Mark Rosen with that and more coming up in sports.
baseball, one of the biggest rivalries in all of hockey, mm -hmm. is uh, just ending now in Chicago. Heating up again. Anytime you play in Chicago in that stadium, everyone gets into the game. It's a tough team, a tough arena, a tough neighborhood, and it was a tough loss for the North Stars. The game was just over. 4-3 in overtime, the Blackhawks over the North Stars. The regular season may not mean all that much, but you don't have to be a hockey purist to enjoy a game as exciting as this one was. This smacked of an April playoff game. 37-year-old helmet ball Darris from Latvia scored his first NHL goal. If you listen to longtime announcer Al Shaver, he says Balderas has the best hands he's ever seen in hockey. Imagine what this guy was like in his prime. The Stars led 3-0. The Hawks would lead the Norris division, got all out, and went all out at home. Dirk Rand there used to play for the Stars, got the Hawks on the board. And it was up and down all night, and just seconds ago, watch what happens. The puck is getting kicked all over the place, but Doug Wilson with that blistering shot from the point wins it for Chicago in overtime. The two teams will be back home at Met Center on Saturday night. A big win for Chicago. Meanwhile, off the ice, Edmonton and Detroit swapped six players this afternoon. The key player is high-scoring center Jimmy Carson, who goes to Detroit along with Kevin McClellan. Edmonton gets a bundle. Peter Klima, good hockey player, has had a lot of trouble off the ice. Joe Murphy, Adam Graves, and Jeff Sharples. Another first for the Timberwolves. Their first tip-off luncheon today at the Radisson St. Paul. Coach Bill Musselman and his players tried to enjoy both the food and the festivities today. It's hard to imagine Bill enjoying anything this time of year. Then they catch a 2.30 flight to Seattle where they'll play the franchise's first regular season game tomorrow night, 9 o'clock. We'll have live reports from Scott Reynolds from Seattle tomorrow on our 5 and 6 p.m. reports. The state soccer championship is on the line tonight at the Metrodome, so is a lot of pride. Last year, Apple Valley won the title after ending SPA's record-setting winning streak. Tonight, in a championship rematch, they are at no score in the third quarter. The best chance of this match came on an Apple Valley corner kick. The defending champs had a couple of chances, but as you can see, they just could not knock it home. SPA star Manuel Lagos has been held in check, although he saved the day there, clearing the ball out of trouble. No score at the moment in the third quarter. As we check the scoreboard there in the girls' championship, Anoka over Park of Cottage Grove, 1-0 in an overtime shootout. Anoka's star goalie, Brianna Scurry, scored the biggest goal of the shootout, a goalie after blanking Park through regulation in two overtimes. She scored the game winner for the Tornadoes, putting them ahead 2-0 in the shootout. Junior Melissa Lindquist scored the clincher for Anoka, and the celebration was on at the Dome. Anoka wins the state championship 1-0 by beating Parker Cottage Grove there 3-1 to one in the shootout. She's at the bottom of that pile somewhere. Nine-man football always causes a stir when the high schools take over the Dome for Prep Bowl. It's always a crazy game, a lot of fun to watch. On the eve of the section finals, our weekly prep profile features the top-ranked team of nine-man football, Winston Holy Trinity. Mike Max has more on the team and the town. Annie's Bakery on an autumn afternoon. A local ladies' bowling team is enjoying a cup of coffee. The talk is not strikes and gutters, but football. And it's very unusual when you play nine-man football and make it in the pros because they call that playing fun football. Donna Gugamus is referring to son Neil. Before his NFL career, he led Winstead Holy Trinity to a conference championship in 1981. It's been repeated in 89, and the town is again buzzing. You can't find a parking spot down there by the football field. It'll be an overflow, I'm sure. Yes, football has hit a fever pitch here in Winstead. That happens when you combine an unbeaten season with the state's number one ranking. Ready, set, hut! Jim Brown coaches just 27 kids in four grades, making two ingredients essential. We like to keep people uh, off the injury list. Uh, we like to have fun. Maybe that's... Uh, I think that's a big part of high school football. No one's having more fun than star running back Luke Schoenfelder. He's the blue chipper, ready to realize a dream shared by everyone in the community. It's been a lot of talk around here that we can do it this year, and it's one of the best teams we've had, so prep ball. He'll get no objections from the folks in Winstead. With photographer Keith Schnell, Mike Max, WCCO Television Sports, reporting. Remember when Bud Grant was coaching the Vikings? No gloves on the sidelines, no hand warmers, nothing. 1989, just a bit different. Our on-the-scene correspondent, defensive end Doug Martin, picks up the story from Winter Park. Okay, we're live here at Winter Park today. It's about uh, 35 degrees. 
players are getting ready to practice right now. Uh, hey, come on, guys. Hey, go on, go on a show here. Yeah, stop. <laughs> Let's check out the latest in winter wear. Jim Gustafson modeling a real practical article of clothing for a wide receiver. That works well waiting for that early morning bus ride as you look at the... Uh, beginning the ears protected, DJ Dozier. The Vikings are playing indoors this week, but keep in mind they still have games in Philadelphia, in Milwaukee, and in Cleveland in December. Number 42, they're representing uh, Greg Bell, the outstanding running back for <laughs> the Rams. A little chilly Gustafson out there. Gustafson had a muff? <laughs> you saw it. Is that right? Well, Bud would be going... Oh. <laughs> So ashamed. Well, coming up next, we're going to find out if a miracle story really ends with a miracle. It's who you are. Save the special moments in your life with an RCA camcorder package from Best Buy. You'll get an autofocus 6 to 1 power zoom lens, excellent 3 Lux low light capability, and an advanced flying away set that lets you start, stop, and insert scenes without glitches. Complete with a telephoto lens, hard case, and full one year warranty, it's yours for just $899 at Best Buy. What you need, how you feel, every day of your life. Tonight we have a follow-up to a dimension report we brought you several weeks ago. It's the story of Pacho Penaloza, a young Bolivian man who was accidentally shot in the head four years ago. Now, Cindy Hilger has been following the Pacho story, and she joins us now with an update. John and Colleen, Pacho has been in Minnesota since July, thanks to a group of social service workers and medical officials in St. Paul. They heard about Pacho's injury and raised the money to bring him here. Since July, Pacho has been under the care of two plastic surgeons who have spent hours with Pacho preparing him for today, the day Pacho received a new skull and a new lease on life. Pacho and his mother arrived at United Hospital two hours before surgery, a bit nervous, but anxious to have this whole ordeal behind them. He feels very good. Uh, he's glad that the previous steps that he has to take care of are over, they're done, and that now he's a missed step. And I'll just take your pulse here. In the five months leading up to this day, doctors have been stretching Pacho's scalp. The extra scalp will fit over the new skull doctors will create for Pacho, using bones from other parts of his body. An intricate operation to be sure, but one Pacho's mother knows will be a success. God has started this work in him, and now with this operation, he will finish what he started. Before Pacho is led away to surgery, there is a brief last-minute prayer and words of encouragement. This was our last glimpse of Pacho. Pacho, good luck. Thanks. Pacho spent five hours on the operating room table, a bit longer than doctors expected, but they had to borrow from his ribs to get extra bone for his new skull. It's one of the cases that you can convert somebody from a very obvious deformity to uh, a fairly normal appearance, and that's not always the case with such a severe deformity. Doctor, muchas gracias. Doctors Pilney and Scow were able to tell Pacho's mom that soon no one will know Pacho had such a severe deformity. The surgery was a success. And for that, there was thanks. Pacho's skull will be swollen and discolored for the next few days, and he'll stay at United for about a week. Then he'll rejoin his mother at their apartment on the west side of St. Paul. And if all goes as planned, Pacho will go back to Bolivia by December 1st. But well, before he goes back, we'll get one last final visit with him to see how well the surgery went. I think you'll be surprised at how he looks. Good. Thank you very much. What a great Amazing. story. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everyone. SHF, weeknights on Channel 4. Good morning. Many people feel inferior and some even hate themselves. Perhaps it is something that we all start out with. Yet at the same time, the message of the gospel is that we are children of the living God. You see, Christ displayed no inferiority. Indeed, his dignity was such that his intimates took no liberties. 
his judge feared and condemned him. Armed men were awed by his presence. This same Christ will help us with our inferiority as well. Take the time to share and help support the Minneapolis Children's Medical Center. Hi, I'm Don Shelby. Join WCCO-TV for A Red Ribbon Affair, a very special evening of shopping and music and food and prizes here at the Conservatory. Participating stores will donate 10% of all purchases to help the Minneapolis Children's Research Endowment Fund. A Red Ribbon Affair, Thursday, November 16th. For ticket information, call 863-6621. Looking for some good sports? The best in sports are on CCO. Mark Rosen, Scott Reynolds, and Ralph John Fritz have got you covered, and that's good sports for you. If you think a child is being abused or neglected, you may wonder what to do. You may be afraid to get involved. You may wonder where to turn for help. That's why so many cases of child abuse go unreported. And that's why it's so important to call the professionals at Child Protection. And that's why at Child Protection, you can call 24 hours a day. Child Protection. If you have any information on the kidnapping or whereabouts of Jacob Wetterling, please call 612-259-3981. Anna Hugh, weekdays at 8 on Channel 4. The Senate says Oliver North should get his pension back. More East Germans flee despite new moves toward reform. And the family of collapsed freeway survivor Buck Helm hires an agent, but says it's not going Hollywood yet. This is the CBS Morning News. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charles Osgood. And I'm Victoria Corderi. Faith Daniels will be joining us later on CBS This Morning. It's Friday, November 3rd. Oliver North may soon be getting a retirement.